Well, hello everybody, this is John Michael Talbot. All things are possible with God. Do you ever feel like you are just besieged by sexual immorality in this world, especially in the Western world? Guess what? There's a way out. There's a way to be pure. All things are possible with God. Well, howdy everybody, this is John Michael. I love you guys. And today we're gonna to be talking about the power of God's love, specifically in chastity. You know, traditionally, ever since the 13th century, those who are in so-called religious life in the church make vows or promises of poverty and chastity and obedience. Well, we talked about poverty in the last one, but let's talk about chastity today. And this is tough because here in the United States, man, we, are, we hear sexual immorality coming at us all the time. It's in our music, it's in our media, it's everywhere. It's on the internet, see? I, I turn on TV every now and then, and, I, and I, you know, I just wanna watch a good drama. But instead of getting drama, I get a social message being brought to me through that program that things that Judeo-Christian morality doesn't support are okay. We have shifted from a Judeo-Christian moral base to a secular humanist base. And if you don't think it's happening, you're asleep at the switch. It's coming at us in our television, in our movies, in our music, and yeah, all over the internet. You know, I wrote a book many years ago called The Lover and the Beloved. And in that book, I really try to bring out what's called spousal mysticism. Mysticism just means we can't put it totally into words. See, love is a mystery, isn't it? We can describe things about love, but there are other things about love we can't describe. I go up to husbands and wives. I try to pick the ones that have been married the longest when I do you know, missions and revival out in parishes. And so I go up to him and I say, to the man, I say, uh, do you have her figured out yet? And he will always look up at me and go, nope. And then the punchline is, is yeah, but sir, she had you figured out on the first date. <laughs> no, really, love is a mystery. There are parts of it that we can describe, there are parts of it that we can't describe. So it's called mysticism. It's not really all that complicated. It's just about love. And God is love. The Trinity is love mystery between the three in the one. The incarnation is love. That God would become a human being out of love for you and me. See, His death on a cross is love for you and me. His resurrection is to show the victory of love over self-obsession and hatred and, yes, unchastity. The gift of the Spirit to the church is love. The sacraments, what does sacrament mean? It means sacred mystery, see, is love. You can't figure love out totally. So in this book, we talk about the really the four stages of how you bring together a, a love relationship. The first stage is something that you do that, you, it's called dialogue. You talk to each other. Where are you from? <laughs> what do you wanna do when we get together, if we get together? Do you wanna live on the North Pole or the South Pole? Well, if I wanna live on the North Pole and she wants to live on the South Pole, cohabitation is going to be very difficult. <laughs> So that's dialogue and it's objective. There are facts involved with it, just like in marriage. You have to, you have to talk and kind of get some of, the, some of the basics that you agree on. And sometimes you can feel the love attraction, but when you get into that dialogue, you go, well, probably not a good idea to get married. We want too many different things. Wouldn't work. And the same thing is true in our love relationship with Jesus and the teaching of the church. We have teachings on faith, and morality. 
They're objective. There are things that are right about them, and there are things that are wrong. This is right. This is wrong. This is good. This is bad. That's our dialogue, and that comes to us through Scripture. It comes to us through apostolic tradition, and it comes to us through the teaching authority of the church. And they're just basics, but they're not the goal. They're just the very beginning. They're just pointing in the direction of the love union. So you decide to get married with Jesus. You're baptized, you're confirmed, you receive the sacraments. <laughs> what comes next? The marriage is consummated. That consummation of the marriage is passionate. It is fervent. It's beyond logic. You don't sit when you're, when you're madly in love with your wife or your husband. You don't sit and say, you know, well, how do you want to embrace? Should I move to the left or to the right? You don't do that. It's passion. It's eros. Eros and its consummation. It is totally beyond logic. It is totally beyond description. It's beyond what we can explain. So we have that in our relationship with Jesus through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and that initial fervor, that initial fire, that initial enthusiasm. But what comes next? Well, what comes next is afterglow. After you've had that passionate experience of God through Christ, just like with a man and a woman, you have silence, stillness, absolute contentment, just being with each other. Oh, you don't talk right away. <laughs> you don't get all passionate again. You don't do the, 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 the other two stages. What you're going to do now is just learn to be with each other. And that's the contemplative stage of our union with God through Jesus. He is the spouse. See, he is the bridegroom. We are the bride, the church. So that's so important to be still, to know he is God and to not rush it. You don't jump up and go away. You just be together with Jesus. But that's not the end, not by a long shot. <laughs> The next morning, you got to get up. You got to get the breakfast ready. You, you know, you, you've consummated your union before, and the church has gotten pregnant and fat, and she's had kids, <laughs> lots of kids, a billion kids around the world. <laughs> and you got to take care of them. You got to wake them up. They don't always want to wake up. You wake them up. Well, <laughs> Then you got to feed them. You got to cook breakfast. And you got to get them off to school. That is the evangelistic work of the church. And each one of us, see, follow me here, because Scripture and then St. Augustine say that the church is the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ. But around about, oh, the 11th century, a guy named St. Bernard of Clairvaux wrote a treatise on the Song of Song, and he says not only does it apply to the church as a corporate reality, it applies to each soul personally. So the question is, do you have that spousal love with God through Christ? Do you have that personal relationship with Jesus? Are you impregnated by the Holy Spirit? Do you have your doctrine right? Do you have your passion right? Do you have your contemplation right? And do you have your evangelism right? See, we got to get these things straight before we start dealing with the external matters of sexual morality and family. Well, I want to sing a song that's going to talk about that love relationship with Jesus. It comes from St. John of the Cross. I found my beloved. I hope as I sing it, you find your beloved too in Jesus. And I found your footprints in the sands by the sea. 
And like your maiden, I ran along the way to a secret chamber. So I have abandoned All I ever saw to be And in dying My spirit has been Well, hello, everybody. This is John Michael again. Have you found your beloved? Jesus is your beloved. He is the fulfillment of every state of life, of every relationship we could ever want. See, if Jesus is our lover, then we can have an expression of that love relationship with Christ with other people in the way that Jesus wants us to do. If we are satisfied with Him and Him alone, then we can either be alone with Him or we can be with other people together with Him, either in community or in marriage. There's different ways to live it to live it out. I want to I want to kind of drill down if you will on some of the ways that we can actually follow Jesus. I'm going to read from the rule and constitution of the community that I'm a part of, the Brothers and Sisters of Charity, and we have a scripture rule. And the scripture rule really does uh, explain the different states of life. And they're very, they're very simple. We can follow Jesus in celibacy either as a single person ready for marriage or open to marriage, or in consecrated chastity for life or for a definite period of time, or we can follow Jesus in conjugal chastity within the context of marriage. So let's get kind of more specific about that. And Jesus hints at this. He, he says in Matthew 19, some men have freely renounced sex for the sake of God's reign. Let him accept this teaching who can. Everyone who has given up home or wife or children or property for my sake will receive many times as much and inherit everlasting life. See, again, when you renounce stuff, folks, you're not getting the short end of the stick. When you renounce all, you gain everything. When you follow His way of love, His way, of chastity, what you discover is you begin to be able to love everybody in a way that is holy and life-giving and pure. See, not in a way that's reaching out to use other people for your own satisfaction. Real love is self-giving. It is self-emptying. The word in scripture is kenosis, to empty ourself for God and for others. And when you can do that, gee, you're happy wherever you go in whatever state of life Jesus might call you to. And he calls people to different states of life, each one equally holy. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, I should like you to be free of all worries. The unmarried man is busy with the Lord's affairs, concerning with pleasing the Lord, but the married man is busy with the world's demands and occupied with pleasing his wife. So when you get married, well, yeah, it's not just you. You got to take care of your, your spouse. You got to take care of the kids. And that's a responsibility. So part of the call to marriage is saying, am I, am I really, is that what God has called me to? I ask guys who are considering marriage or celibacy, I say, okay, fella, think of getting up in the middle of the night and changing a diaper. See, some, the people who are called to marriage, they go, yeah, I really want to do that. I want to raise this little baby all the way through their life. That just gets my juices going. <laughs> Everybody wants to love other people. That's easy. But raising a family, that's more difficult. See? And celibate folks go, nah, there's something really powerful about the fact of I'm going to be on my own. 
I'm going to experience that tension of wanting to consummate a union with another person, but not being able to and being forced to Jesus and Jesus alone. <laughs> See, so different people, they hear these calls. You have to follow the fire that's in your heart. And truly, Jesus will show you the way. And marriage, Hebrews 13, 4. Let marriage be honored in every way and the marriage bed kept undefiled. Wow. So God honors marriage. Jesus works his first miracle at the wedding feast at Cana. You think he didn't like marriage? Sorry, folks. He did a great miracle right there in the midst of a, of a, of a wedding feast. So there are different ways to do it. First of all, some are called to celibacy. Celibate chastity means that you are not going to have relations sexually with another person. You're not going to act on your sexuality. And that happens in two different ways. It happens with single people who are living the same, but they really do feel called to marriage. They just haven't found the right person yet. But, but the world would say, oh, it's okay, try around. Try this one, try that one. Sleep with this one, sleep with that one. No, this, this, and we'll get to this in a minute. This consummation of, the, of marriage in the sexual act is so intimate, is so self-giving, is so transparent. Uh, you, you can't do it over and over and over again with all kinds of different people because it begins to cheapen it. And that's what happened. We've gotten calloused as a people. We've had sex with so many people that, that we've lost the sensitivity and the beauty of it. It's just become a carnal act, kind of like eating a steak. <laughs> no, no. It's about a love relationship with somebody else. So the single life, you keep yourself pure. You keep yourself chaste, waiting for that person, that one special person. And then you give yourself completely. A consecrated religious are people who take vows of chastity and consecrated chastity, what that means is, well, no, I really feel Jesus saying, I'm supposed to be for him and him alone. He is my spouse. And, and I'm not going to have any physical expression of this. Because, see, here's the thing. Even when we have the most intimate expression of human love between two people on the face of this earth, that pales in comparison with the intimacy that we will all know for eternity in heaven with Jesus. For we will know as we are known. Wow, how powerful is that? So celibacy for consecrated religious are people saying, I'm going to be a prophetic reminder that on the face of this earth, I'm going to remind everybody that even if you experience marriage, we're all headed towards something that makes marriage look like almost nothing, as beautiful as it is. Because we're headed towards an intimacy with God and everyone and everything in heaven that we can't even fathom. Now on the face of this earth, we have conjugal chastity or marriage. And the church is very clear, and I think very beautifully so, in promoting life and in promoting a natural expression of this love union between two peoples. And there are three things that the church has traditionally taught in the modern era especially. The first is a mutual self-giving. How different is that <laughs> than what we see in the world where you have a relationship with somebody else so that you can be fulfilled. See, when you, when you have mutual self-giving, I am giving for the other person. I am being like Jesus for the other person. I am emptying myself of myself for their sake. And the sexual act is for their sake, not for mine. Whew. That's heavy. And it is radically countercultural to what is the accepted norm. And guess what you get fulfilled more than you could ever want? 30, 60, and 100-fold in the process. 
It's within the context of marriage. This, this naked embrace you have with another person. This is so sacred. It is so powerful. And if you do it over and over and over and over and over again, it calluses your soul. So the reason the church says in the context of marriage is that it remains something that is so special, so holy, so pure. And yes, folks, it is countercultural, big time. And the last thing, and this is, this is heavy, where procreation is possible under ordinary circumstances. Now, some people can't have children. Church isn't saying that they're not married. But ordinarily, that procreation is possible. Well, use your imagination. I'm not going to go down and list what the church says you're not supposed to do because the church doesn't just say what you're not supposed to do. The church is saying what you're supposed to do. It's not saying what you can't do. It's saying what you can do. So the sexual act with procreation as a possibility, it creates that sacredness of life, self-giving one for the other and creating at least a third under normal circumstances. And therefore, every family becomes an expression of the sacred trinity, where three are sharing with each other. Well, that's just scratching the surface of this. The church, the church is not, and Christianity is not about what you can't do. It's about what you can do. It's not against life. It's for life. Let Jesus be your lover today. Come into that personal love relationship with Christ, and Jesus will call you to the state of life he has just for you. I love you guys. Stay pure for Jesus, and you will be happier and more fulfilled than the world can ever match. Only in God is my soul at rest. In Him comes my salvation. He only is my rock, my strength and my salvation my stronghold my savior i shall not be afraid at all my stronghold my Savior, I shall not be moved. Only in God is found safety when the inner pursues me only in God is found glory when I am found meek and found lowly my stronghold my say shall not be afraid at all, my stronghold, my Savior, I shall not be is 
is my soul at rest in him comes my salvation 